So you've been a producer reporter at CTV News, a senior journalist at Routers, and a deputy news editor at the Canadian Press. You're a professor now at UCAM. Um, how did you get your start? How did you come to be doing what you're doing today? If you want to just tell me a little bit about that journey. Well, I was studying journalism and political science at Laval University in Quebec City between 1988 and 1991. I was, all doing, I was already doing a lot of community radio in Quebec City. Uh, at the local level, at the CJEP, at the high school, at the university as well. So I had already uh, a lot of experience on the community radio side. And uh, I was also bilingual uh, in Quebec City, which was where at the time. So I was very lucky CTV New, National News was looking for a part-time researcher at their Quebec City office at the press gallery of the Quebec legislature. And I was just the right person at the right time. And I spent seven years at CTV News. I was hired back then at 19. I was at my fourth semester okay. at the university. So being bilingual, you know, uh, I was able to join CTV National News and then Reuters and uh, then uh, Le Journal de Québec, Canadian Press, CNU.ca. And I also founded and managed Huffington Post Quebec during eight years. And I've been teaching for the past two years. So, you know, I was just lucky, bilingual, right time, right place. And I was passionate about writing and, uh, and being a journalist, even yeah. at the CJEP level. You wrote a book, The CNN Village, The Crisis of International News Agency. Yeah. Um, could you share, like, a lot of this project is sort of about trust in media. Could you share maybe your thoughts on um, the Americanization of globalization and just do you think that um, Canadian media is more trustworthy than American media? Well, the CNN Village was uh, published in 1997, but the writing of the, uh, the, this was a master's degree thesis in political science at Laval University. That was written between 92 and 94. Then I up updated the whole thing between 94 and 97. Trust was not an issue at the time, the big issue in those days, the 1990s was the beginning of the internet, which in which most media organization did not believe at all. They did not anticipate the internet revolution. They did not understand it. The big story at the time was the rise of real time uh, cable TV news coverage, like CNN, RDI, LCN in Quebec, CBC, News World in Canada. And if you look at that story 25 years later, now we have an issue of trust. 44% uh, of uh, Canadians in your uh, digital Reuters report uh, uh, on trusting Canadian media, that's a very, very low and sad uh, uh, state of affairs. Obviously, it's worse in the US because you have only two political parties. You have a political system that is outdated and rooted in the 18th century. Uh, the electoral college uh, system is totally outdated. The entire political system is ruled by money. So in Canada, you have five parties. Uh, it's much less, much, much less partisan. But you, but you end up in the same situation where one Canadian out of five uh, believes that uh, COVID-19 is just uh, an invention. Uh, and uh, you have a situation where you have less and less trust in media news organizations. So that's a, a big problem for uh, democracy in general, for society at large. But yes, the, the situation is less worse in Canada because it's a less polarized country with which less population as well. I mean, in the US, you had the census two days ago, you're talking about 331 million people, 60 million of them being illegal immigrants. In Canada, you have barely 40 million people. So it's much easier to manage uh, in a way. Do you think things have gotten better or worse and why? Well, it depends. Uh, now you have uh, much more access to information uh social media has allowed the average canadian to uh, access hundreds and thousands of source 
of information versus the 1990s where you only had a couple of newspapers, a couple of radio stations and uh, TV networks. Now you can visit the world uh, through the internet. You have access to uh, uh, an amazing uh, amount of information, but uh, at the same time, uh, the uh, algorithms created by social media are creating extremisms on both sides, polarization of the public discourse. But overall, it's been a plus because uh, people have access to much more information. But you have the crisis of the news media, which has been ongoing for the past 30 years. So it's a permanent media crisis. And yes, there is a question of trust as well that has been lingering for the past uh, five to 10 years. And that, that was aggravated by the uh, terrible uh, four-year tenure of U.S. President Trump. The main driving factor is like, is it an economic crisis? Is it like... Um... It's like an economic crisis driven by the transfer of advertising revenues from news media to uh, Google, Facebook, and the others. Right now, they share 81% of the digital digital advertising market worldwide. So that happened in the past 10 years. We have also, also the issue of trust. People trust less and less the media organization because they feel that there is a disconnection between the media and the people. Uh, they feel there's too much sensationalism. It's too much uh, sensational. Uh, and also you have uh, extreme right-wing news organizations like OAN, Newsmax, Fox News, Rebel News in Canada, which are uh, propagate, propagating uh, fake news and disinformation. So that's not helping at all. Do you think that trust in media is a problem that needs to be addressed? Like, is it um, overblown? Is it like... No, it's not overblown. It has yeah. to be addressed through various means. Uh, fact checking if dog blockchain can help great ai is helping as well to detect fake news fake photos deep fake videos so that's a plus you saw a big story this morning about google news uh, making a major alliance with the news agency afp agence france presse facebook has an alliance with reuters and the canadian press for fact checking but fact checking is only a drop in the ocean. It's one uh, one solution among others. Fact checking is uh, is great, but it's not enough to actually settle the problem. What would um, what is needed to settle the problem? Well, you're going to need uh, civic media education, compulsory civic media education from grade one to grade thirteen, probably uh, nationwide in Canada and in the US where you're gonna explain to uh, young kids and future adults uh, the role of a news organization, the process of news selection, agenda setting, social media, uh, the uh, challenge of fake news and misinformation and explaining the role of a journalist in a democratic society and uh, the actual process of uh, of uh, news making and the news processing. So speaking of deep fake videos, since we're doing this over Zoom, um, right now there's a ban on in-person interviews. So I just, um, rather than asking for special permission, I'm just using Zoom right now. So how do I know that I'm talking to you? Well, you have pictures of me on the internet. You have my pictures on the UCAM website. I've been doing a lot of radio and TV in the past 30 years. I'm 51. Uh, I, I have a very strong social media presence. So you, have, you also have my professional working email address and you have my linking account and all the others. So, and I mean, I think it's proof enough for me that I'm real. <laughs> uh, and I'm not being impersonated, but my I, Twitter account was hijacked uh, last fall, yeah. four days before the U.S. elections. So maybe there are some people who do, do not like the role of a professor of journalism who has 31 uh, years of experience in journalism and who is quite critical about uh, fake news, misinformation, and the role of China and Russia in that uh, terrible propaganda process right now. But I'm, I'm the real, I'm, I'm the real deal. I'm the real person you're talking to. 
is as well for fact checking like has there ever been a time in your like long career when you were um, impacted by inaccurate reporting and and how did you deal with that like have you ever no it, it, it like never that? happened to me i'm not a controversial person so i'm kind yeah. of lucky i'm not a pundit like patrick lagacé who steers the pot every uh, two or three days uh, uh, so no, I mean, I, uh, I'm a reasonable person, you know, I worked a lot for news agencies, Reuters, uh, CP and uh, major newspapers and Chinoo.ca was the top news portal in Canada at the time. So I have a reputation of credibility and I only publish facts and not opinions. So I think it, it, it plays on my side. But yes, there is a huge distrust in journalists in Canada right now, if you look at demonstrations. Uh, against uh, safe uh, sanit sanitary uh, regulations about COVID-19. Journalists are insulted now. Uh, people are spitting on journalists. They are uh, insulting journalists publicly on social media. So this level of eight, I've never seen that uh, before 2018 in, in Quebec specifically. So Why that's a new phenomenon. It's very worrying. How do you think it is that people attack journalists and not you know, politicians or, or like, I mean, they do as well, but why do you think that people, um, why do you think journalists are a target of that kind of I, It's fueled by the uh, public discourse by Donald Trump that journalists are the enemy of the people. And that, that terrible philosophy was imported from the US start, starting in 2016. And that has aggravated over the past few years with, uh, you know, uh, illegitimate news organizations like Rebel News and uh, lesmanchettes.com in Quebec and R Radio Quebec, which is a complotist, uh, propagandist, anti-COVID uh, uh, vaccine uh, in Quebec led by Alexis Trudel-Cosset. You see a lot of QAnon organizations blaming the, the media for about everything. And you have also Fox News, OAN, and Newsmax not helping in the U.S. Uh, uh, propagating a lot of uh, lies about news organizations in, the, in general and journalists, the role of journalists in the democratic society. So it's a complicity of a right-wing media organization, propagandist organization, QAnon, and uh, the rise of President Trump between 2016 and 2020 earlier this year. And how about like more serious forms of disinformation and media manipul manipul manipulation? I don't know. I can't say that. Like um, by like foreign um, actors and. Yeah. And so whatever. right now and for the past five six years, you actually have fake news factories in Mas Macedonia, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Iran, uh, China, and your and even Brazil during the 2018 presidential election. There is a documentary from TV5 you should watch. It's in French. It's called uh, La Fabrique du Mensonge, the, uh, the, the Lie Factory. And uh, I mean, these, these uh, fake news factories did not exist 10 years ago. So that's a crazy situation where you have state-sponsored uh, networks like RT, uh, Sputnik, uh, Xinhua uh, News Agency, the total censorship of digital uh, media in China and in Iran, and uh, uh, the start of a digital di di dictatorship in in Russia, with Putin being there, being in power for twenty years. So yes, you have the this rise of uh, you know news factories in Brazil. You are creating fake news every day, memes. Uh, short videos for TikTok and WhatsApp and all the other social uh, media platforms who are actually with their algorithms promoting uh, extreme views on many topics and including the political discourse and uh, the public domain and the politics in general. So yes, it, there's been a rise of uh, fake news, propaganda, disinformation by, uh, by countries, especially Russia, China and Iran. And we could extend that to other countries as well, like Brazil and India as well, right now. What, what do you think might be done about it? Like, is, is that just a, there's nothing you can do about it except educate people? Or is there, 
Like, we need to educate people. So people, social media platform has already, have already started to tag uh, posts from state-sponsored uh, news organizations uh, in social media. So we know on Twitter when it's RT, it's uh, state-sponsored, affiliate to Russian government uh, TV network. So it's a start. Uh, yes, we need to educate people. You know, uh, if you're watching Al Jazeera, you know, yes, they, they're not going to report the same facts as CNN, but at the same point, uh, it's not bad to have the uh, point of view from the Arabic countries as well and from the Palestinian people. So that's a check and balances in a way. But when you look at uh, RT and Sputnik, they're really uh, trying to destabilize a lot of countries, including France and the US. So it's a war between, uh, you know, uh, the civilized world, the Western countries, and uh, people from uh, from Asia and Russia. You know, the the it's a civilization war, but it's also an ideological war between China, Russia, and the rest of the world. And yeah, I mean, I think governments are getting involved. Uh, you see, uh, there there are going to be two legislations unveiled in Canada this year by uh, Canadian Heritage Minister Stephen Gilbo about. Uh, the uh, comment moderation in social platforms, uh, social media content, and all that sort of things. There's a wake up call happening worldwide, and social media platforms are starting to abide by uh, finger pointing uh, content that is considered uh, as propaganda. And that's a start. And civic education at the high school and primary school level could be a, a sol solution as well to, uh, to help understand and distinguish real news organization from propaganda or news organizations. Moving back to fact checking, um, do you have any, like of all the sort of common fact checking sites like Snopes and stuff like that and tools like Hoaxy, do you have one that you use often or like a go-to that you use? And if so, what do you like about it? And well, I, I read a lot uh, Agence Science Presse, which is, which is the only uh, scientific news agency in Quebec. Uh, and Les Decrypteurs on RDI, which is the French news channel of, uh, of uh, CBC news channel. So, you know, I, I, as far as fact checking is concerned, I mean, I'm a professional journalist. I do my own fact checking and I check what uh, Agence Science Presse is doing and what RDI is working on. You have fact checkers at L'Actualité, at the Metro uh, in Montreal, which is a, a weekly uh, displayed in the subway system of Montreal. And yes, I look at, at Snopes and others, and I see all the, uh, the tagged uh, posts uh, on Facebook and Twitter. So uh, that reminds me that sometimes before reading an article, that's good to see the, if the label is, is, is there. Uh, fake news label or propaganda label. But yeah, I mean, fact checking, uh, there's a lot of fact checking done by Reuters, AFP, AP, Bloomberg. So I, rel I, I tend to rely on that a lot. I, be I believe a lot in the power of news agencies as uh, objective news organizations with 200 years of history in the case of Reuters, AFP and AP. Do you have any opinions on blockchain and journalism or? Uh, so that... far it's been a failure. If you look at the master's degree thesis that was unveiled at the University of Quebec at Montreal two weeks ago, I could send you a copy of the thesis if you want. Because yeah, sure. that's, that's the only one about journalism and blockchain unveiled in the past two, three years. So the, uh, she studied the, the flop, the failure of civil in the okay. US, the millions of dollars wasted in that uh, program. So if you look at civil, if you take that as an approach, at the first approach, it's been a failure so far. I myself, I believe in it uh, because of micro payments, which could be a way to monetize content for news organizations. And I believe it could be a great tool for fact checking with the timestamp, the fact that you could not reverse a story that's been published. So when you think about George Orwell and the falsification of archives in news organizations in, in his 1948 novel, 1984, that could not happen with blockchain. You could also do a fact-checking with sources, priori prioritize uh, 
you know, uh, credible news organizations through blockchain. Like you, you, at the top, you could have Reuters, AP, Bloomberg, uh, uh, Canadian Press, news agencies, and uh, BBC News, and established news organization worldwide could be in, in the green area uh, of the blockchain. And that could be a, a tool, a detection tool for fake news. Uh, propaganda, misinformation, and stuff like that. And it could also help to detect uh, the use of fake photos, deep fake videos. And uh, when you see a story coming from Breitbart or the New York Post, maybe that could be a block by blockchain uh, saying, well, you should be wary of that New York Post story about Vice President Kamala Harris, because it looks like the sources are non-existent. So in a sense, in that regard, if you look at micropayments and fact checking, and also uh, the monet monetization of content or archives, that could be an amazing, uh, an amazing plus for news organization to proceed with uh, blockchain in the future. And that's why I, I accept to participate in your project because I, I looked at your video today and I looked at the overall project that you sent me a few months ago. It, it's a step in the right direction, I think as far as the uh, fact checking is concerned and the credibility of news organization nor news organization trust in news organization and the possibility of uh, of uh, monetizing uh, great content what do you think might be some barriers to blockchain being, blockchain um, is not well on the, it's not well known it's not well understood people think it's uh, directly related to cryptocurrency which are quite unstable and are destabilizing uh, financial markets right now. So it's just the bad publicity around uh, crypto money and cryptocurrency and uh, a lot of uh, fraud in that uh, in the financial markets and the the, the misunderstanding uh, of what is blockchain all about. So it's not a well known technology and it's going to take twenty five years for people to to fully understand it. Unfortunately, it's too complicated and uh, not uh, well known enough for the average uh, the Joe in the street. Do you think that um, that it will take that long? Like if, if you look back at the beginning of the internet where it was like, there was so many scams and so many websites that were just, they weren't anything. There was just a domain name and like, um, but then it kind of got adopted pretty quickly. But like, do you think that the, um, media is underestimating how quickly it could be adopted again yeah, the, media, the, media, like the media underestimated the the internet the media underestimated social media the media uh snubbed ai they snubbed blockchain they totally missed the digital shift they missed the digital advertising shift and they missed the boat in the past 25 years. And I, once again, I think they're gonna miss the AI boat and the blockchain boat. So I think it's gonna take yeah, over 25 years to fully understand the whole process. And the internet started around 92, 93, the World Wide Web in the US, in Canada, not before uh, 95, 96. And I wasn't the first ones to uh, spread the, the word and people were laughing at me for about five years. And, uh, I think it's still the case with AI and blockchain. People just don't get it. Yeah. It's a lack of education and a lack of vision about the future. And the focus is too much on short-term vision instead of mid-term and long-term vision in journalism overall and in the business media, in the media business overall. Do you think could make it more um, attractive or to, to news organizations or, you know. Well, we would need more government grant and funding and research at the education level to spread the word that this could be part of a civic education as well as part of, you know, fact checking uh, 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 initiatives or operations. Otherwise, you know, it's just going to take a while because, you know, you and I, we have master's degrees, we are educated, we work in universities and we're not really the real average guy in the street. So that's going to take a while, uh, unfortunately. But I think government research and funding and uh, focus by education uh, establishments on uh, blockchain, AI, and new technologies could help convince uh, uh, 
the population that these tools could be help, helpful in some ways. And we also need to reduce uh, uh, AI, AI biases, for instance, which are a huge problems when you automate, you know, uh, the liberation of the prisoners in US jails on based on AI algorithms. Well, that's a major problem. You did, these are the kind of uh, decision that should be taken by human beings and the humans should be at the heart of all those decisions and they should not be taken by robots. So you need to have a, a careful approach about AI and blockchain as well, because you want decisions taken by, by human beings as well, not only by machines. This is my master's thesis. I, I know that, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so how about um, when it comes to reporting, do you think there's like a danger of um, journalists like just reporting the same, like not, not seeing the bias in AI or in algorithms and um, like reinforcing it by reporting. Yeah, like, the, the uh, AI biases are reinforced, created by humans all along. Uh, that's why there's so many issues about ethical AI right now around the world. Uh, it's going to take a while. It's going to be a long process. But yes, everybody does agree that the human being needs to remain at the art of all those technological progress, whether it's DNA, genet genetical engineering, AI, blockchain, you need to have a human process of some point. Even if you're talking about the natural language processing and uh, translation with top uh, tools from Google translations, you're never gonna get a perfect translation from French to English or vice versa. You're always gonna need an editor, at a news organization to go over the uh, the story, turning the corners, correct typos and uh, mistranslations. And you're never going to get a robot who's going to be as perfect as the human being, maybe in 75 years, but still then you're going to need humans to uh, supervise the entire, uh, the entire machine process. That said, th these technologies are going to help journalists focus on what matters added value content investigations data journalism solutions journalism investigative journalism uh, interviews uh, in-depth reporting video documentaries about news events public affairs uh, and uh, doing uh, you know added value reporting which is feature reporting uh, in-depth profiles and uh, you know uh, data journalism that's going to change uh, and challenge governments and uh, and uh, policies. Is that part of the reason why, um, or um, perhaps part of the reason why um, news agencies are reluctant to adopt, or at least, well, well, newspapers, why newspapers are reluctant to adopt technologies, ha like having physical paper newspapers is one of those things that ensures that human beings stay in the process? Or what are your thoughts on um, As I said, paper the, newspapers? Will they continue to exist? Is it- They face the media crisis. They survive right now with the, with the, the Canadian Media Help Program and the Quebec Media Help Program. Uh, they survive with subsidies. And they only have a short-term vision about the survival of the news and the industry. They don't have a long-term vision. There's no midterm vision at all. They, they are reluctant to use technologies properly. They're not gonna invest enough in uh, research and development, in AI power technology, and even, even blockchain is not on the horizon at all, maybe except for uh, huge news organizations like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or the Economist or the Financial Times or AFP Reuters, AP Bloomberg, who are huge, massive, news organization. So once again, it's only the big players are going to be able to benefit from that for the moment. But I believe that checkmarker.org, the, the website you introduced to me this morning, could be used by anybody and the, even the average citizen could use it to help uh, protect uh, trust and credibility about news organization and also challenge some stories if they're not well sourced, for instance. So I think the, the, the public, the general public, the population is gonna be able to help to some of these uh, initiatives. But as far as newspaper are concerned, they missed the boat in the past 25 years. They missed the digital shift. They did not, they thought that the internet was a fad in the nineties. 
even in the year 2000. They uh, gave away their content for free to social media platform without monetizing any of it. So they just, it's a major failure when you think about it. And it's going to come again with AI and uh, blockchain. So it's a wake up call. And I think your research is going to help uh, a reflection uh, on those critical issues. There's really a lack of uh, understanding from uh, media organization about the business models of the future and the media business overall. What's, what is the, the economy of the media business right now? They just don't understand the, uh, the, entire, uh, the entire business models that could be, could be, you know, the model right now is various. It could be technology, philanthropy, uh, paywalls, and then great content. If you have all of that, plus you have government money that's flowing from all over right now, all across Canada and Quebec, you have a lot of philanthropic organizations in the US for media right now. Uh, these are solutions to help news organizations go through it, but it has to be a global 360 approach to the whole thing. And I don't think the smaller news organization have a grasp of that at all because they don't want to invest. They're afraid they're reluctant to use new technologies because they don't have the money and they don't have the vision at all. For five, like really small, like all those really small local. They need to work okay. along universities. They need to collaborate among one another. They need to stop working in silos and maybe set up R&D shops for uh, all the top newspapers in Canada, newspaper chain, and work together with CP and CBC and Torstar and Post Media and work together to, to improve the techno te technological approach to a news organization. That's going to be one main solution to help them thrive and survive and monetize the great content they have, like monetize archives. Maybe blockchain could be good for that. If you're able to monetize your archives of the past 200 years at Le Soleil and La Presse and Radio-Canada CBC and the New York Times, and uh, I mean, a lot of people are coming to me every day to, to try to find the archives of Le Journal de Montréal and Le Journal de Québec and some newspaper in Québec who don't archive their stuff. That's crazy in 2021. Does that make sense? You could make hundreds of thousands of dollars with uh, archive content and uh, and actually, you could have AI-powered systems on your website in your CMS to, to uh, recycle evergreen content and archive content onto the website and push it through social media once again and make money out of it. And they don't do that. They could uh, monetize uh, old photos and photo archives and video archives and audio archive. That would be... Uh, this could be amazing tools for, uh, for uh, traffic and for monetization as well. Yeah. Why do you think they don't? Is it just too hard? Like they just don't have the like human resources to... Lack of resources, lack yeah. of vision, lack of understanding of monetization. And, uh, you know, you have a lot of news organization in 2021 in Quebec and Canada who don't have paywalls. But if you have great content, you need a paywall. Otherwise, your content has no value. That's the reality of things.